space is the final frontier, right? It, it's also the final presentation today, so you're probably happy about that. I'm just going to talk a little bit about, uh, you know, why we as industry members are here in the OMG defining standards. You know, what, what's the purpose here? And then we're going to go through quickly a few of the standards that we have. I know, I don't know if I've got any space people in the audience. If there is from somebody from Canadian Space Agency here, sure, look me up and we can go into depth on any of these slides. But I'm going to keep it pretty high. I'm not going to talk Paternians or, or common filters or any of that stuff. We'll just, you know, very high level, this is what we're doing here. Um, it's really about inter interoperability and innovation, right? So as a software industry vendor where I'm trying to sell things to the, this industry, uh, you know, why am I here? And it, it's, it's for these two reasons, right? So even though interoperability opens up my product to competition, it also <clears throat> enables me to ride the cost curve down on technolo technology changes. And as the cost curve comes down, we create bigger markets for software products and space applications. So you're, you're seeing a lot of that in the industry now with CubeSats really reducing the cost of entry to space. And so we think that by driving down costs, we can create bigger markets for, for our products. Um, we we kind of create this uh, virtual cycle, right? Virtual, virtuous circle of competition driving innovation, which drives new capabilities and lower costs which create more opportunities to apply space to uh, problems here on Earth. This is a picture of uh, Sir Arthur C. Clarke. Uh, you probably know him as a science fiction author, but he actually spoke a lot about technology and science uh, while he was alive, uh, not just writing science fiction books. Um, I really like the first quote up here, right? Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. You know, if I, if I uh, talk in my Dick Tracy watch or I, I whip out my supercomputer, which is pocket and internet connected, right? It's also my cell phone. Um, in 1945, when, when Clark was alive, that, those would all be looked upon as magic tricks, right? It's like, this, this doesn't really work. You're just pretending that it works, right? It, it really can't do all those things. Those are impossible, right? And so that kind of brings up the second idea of uh, every, uh, his second quote there, that every revolutionary idea goes through these three stages, right? Completely impossible. Um, it's possible, but <laughs> who would want to do that? And then, uh, well, I, I told you it was a good idea all along, right? So uh, I'm going to go through that with some of ours because I think that uh, space standards or standards in general kind of go through the same evolution. It's like that, that's impossible. You'll never standardize that to, uh, to getting to the point where you have a widespread standard in, in usage. Um, one of the things that Clark, Sir Clark did in, in our industry is in 1945, he actually wrote about geostationary satellites and using them for uh, satellite communication. Keep in mind, this is 12 years before Sputnik was launched, right? So even though it wasn't physically impossible to do that, right? I mean, obviously, we knew the physics. We knew that, that uh, it works, right? There, there's this idea of a geostationary uh, position in space. But uh, technologically, it was, it was way beyond what anybody could think of, right? We couldn't even get an object up into space yet, much less one that is actually complex and works has its own power, et cetera, right? Um, 12 years later, 1957, Sputnik comes along. Yeah, it's just a sphere, beep, 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 going around the world. It, the battery actually ran out in about three weeks. It, uh, it fell into the, the ocean about three months later. Um, but nonetheless, that got us to that second stage. It's like, hey, you know, it might be possible, but nah. It wouldn't be worth doing. I mean, who wants a big ball in space? You need something a little bit more than beep, beep, beep. So, of course, today we're, we're at that third stage, right? Because we have over 250 satellites that are in geostationary orbit today, providing telephone, television, data, internet services all globally. So things have really uh, 
moved through all three stages. So right here in your backyard, just a little bit to the east, uh, Telesat has their satellite control center and offices not very far away from here. And they are, they've actually been a pioneer, uh, have act, you know, started some of the innovations in space, at least them or their predecessor companies. Uh, they were the first intercontinental uh, television broadcast between here and Europe. Uh, there was a, the, a small satellite about 13 watts in power. It was low earth because we didn't have anything out at geostationary at that time. But it transmitted a television signal from uh, one continent to the next. They also had the uh, first commercially operated geostationary satellite. So this was Sputnik plus 15 years, right? And we've got the geostationary satellite that uh, that uh, Arthur C. Clarke imagined. And then after that, they were the first company to operate two geostationary satellites in the same orbital slot, right? The, the ITU had divided up space into these orbital slots around the uh, equator, and the demand for space was getting so high, and the, and the satellite communications that now are having to, to operate them more closely together than uh, was originally planned because the demand was there to do it. Uh, and then finally, uh, they were also the first company to, to provide internet access through a satellite telecommunications. Uh, now, they, they didn't have to just wait for Sputnik on this. They actually had to wait for the internet to get invented much later than Sputnik ever flew. So uh, it was Sputnik plus 39 years for that last one. So I, I titled this slide um, Innovation Versus Interoperability, and I did that intentionally because a lot of engineers think about it that way. That's like, but you know, if I have to write to a standard, if I have to build to a standard, it's going to tie my hands and I'm not going to be able to do uh, the things, the new things that I want to do, these new and innovative things that I want to do. But in reality, it works exactly the opposite way. Good standards don't hinder innovation, they actually enable it. And so if you look at this standard like uh, Hypertext Transfer Protocol, what we call HTTP, that's the backbone of the internet. Without HTTP being there as a standard for all of these other innovators to work on top of, we wouldn't have the internet. So it really enabled a whole bunch of technologies after it came along. Um, I, I thought about it and I tried to come up with a bad standard, one that, in, one that really does hinder innovation. And, I really couldn't come up with any, and that may be because they disappear so quickly we just don't even think about them. But I did come up with an example which, it's not really a bad standard, but maybe uh, it's a standard that was good until it began to hinder innovation, and then it fell, fell by the wayside, as which it probably should have. Um, how many in here are familiar with the ADA programming language? If you'd raise your hand. Okay, we got a lot, of, a lot of ADA people here. How many people in here actually know somebody who's writing or maintaining an ADA code base today? See, it's all those C4I guys. <laughs> because pretty much that has fallen into it's only safety critical applications that are doing it. Um, at the time that it was created back in 1980, uh, actually the first compiler wasn't until 1983, but it was standardized. The uh, U.S. Department of Defense put out a mandate, said, you know, all our new code is going to come in in ADA because we don't want to have to maintain 75 different languages like we're doing today. Um, so, you know, better learn ADA and, and, and write it. The reality was, though, as it was, a, it was a good language, but it was also very complex. The compilers were expensive to build and expensive for the, the developers to buy. They were way slower than the other compilers, and it was difficult for the compiler developers to keep up with all of the advances that were occurring in microprocessor technology at the same time. So by 97, 1997, the, the Department of Defense gave up and said, okay, we're not gonna do that whole, that whole ADA thing was a great idea, but we're not gonna do it as, as a rule for all incoming software. Um, like I say, it is still used in niches such as uh, aviation programs. I think the Canadian uh, air traffic control system is actually uh, an ADA 
based system as well. So a lot of safety critical stuff, it, it fills a niche, but it's not a generally widespread used standard the way it uh, was when it was uh, originally intended. Okay, so I'll switch gears now and then I'll, we'll talk about some of the standards that we are pub have published or are publishing here in, uh, in the Space Domain Task Force. So the first one um, is the XML telemetry and command exchange format. We call it ecstasy, so uh, a little easier to pronounce. So ecstasy is an information exchange standard that describes telecommand and telemetry data that flows between the control center, right, the control center down here, and the satellite. And I want to make it clear that we do not use XML to actually transfer the data up here. We're only describing that data link. The data link itself is typically binary and is as, as bandwidth efficient as we can make it. But the XML that we use to describe it is pretty verbose and takes up lots of space. But uh, the, the idea behind this um, exchange format is that the satellite factory that develops the satellite and builds and you know, essentially designs what's going on this link, control and uh, command monitoring wise, can create an ecstasy document that they then transmit to the satellite operations center, who takes it over and, and maintains the database from there, there on out. But that operations center may actually transfer it to other operations centers that cooperate with them, or they may transfer it to the, the technology refresh that occurs when you build a new ground system because many of these satellites, especially the geostationaries, are up there for 12 to 15 years and meanwhile the equipment on the ground is obsolete in five so you have to refresh the center you know, two or three times before the satellite dies. So that's, that's the problem that Ecstasy was designed to solve is to provide that continuity of information over, over time and between, uh, between different organizations. Uh, the second one is the uh, GEMS, uh, which is a ground equipment monitoring service. Um, the idea behind this is that it's, uh, it defines the data that's used, to, uh, oops, that's used to control the ground equipment and to get status from the ground equipment. So it's similar in nature to ecstasy, but it, it uh, it's because that those, these data formats don't have to be quite as compressed, it's, a, it's actually much simpler and we use it to actually transmit the real data between the uh, ground equipment. This makes it easier for the, the ground station developers to integrate new equipment into their system, uh, you know, even an existing system because it uses the same protocol as the other devices. This, this one uh, is actually used by the two of the main baseband and communications uh, vendors here in the U.S. and uh, or in the U.S. and so it's used all over the world. A lot of people don't know that they have gems in their control center, but they they do just because they used it as part of the box. It's also used at the ground station for the International Space Station. Um, I should and I should have said that on on ecstasy. Ecstasy has been used on, on quite a number of, uh, of government satellite programs. Uh, it has also been adopted by CCSDS as a, as a, specific, a blue book recommendation that, that they use. Um, it was used in the U.S. recently on the GOES 16 and 17 weather satellites for their, uh, sa their command and telemetry definitions. And it, was used commercially by the Iridium Next constellation for their definitions there in the process of their Iridium Next launch campaign for 60SEC satellites. So, so both of these specifications are used uh, quite extensively. And then for some of the things that we've got uh, coming down the road, um, the command and control messaging specification we actually adopted. Uh, with cooperation from NASA Goddard. Uh, what happened is that the Air Force, the United States Air Force came to us and said, we'd really like to use this specification <laughs> that Goddard is using internally. Um, we'd like to use it in our enterprise ground service of the, of, of the future, right? We want to define it, but we want it to be uh, a publicly available specification versus one that's internal to another government agency. 
say, can you do this? And so we worked with NASA, and NASA sort of abstracted it from the API and everything else that they had built around it and said, OK, here's the messaging spec by itself. Um, we published it as an RFC. It was adopted uh, this year. It's in finalization and will be available as a publicly available specification early next year. So it's, it's a really a good example of how government agencies and, and nonprofits come into the OMG and by their participation they can help influence the specifications that we develop, but it also means that as, as industry we get to influence that and make sure it's specifications that we actually want to build to, or in this case that we had already built to. So. And then this one, the, the CubeSat system reference model is is an RFP. Actually, we're hope it will be published out of this meeting. So we just uh, got through our architecture board this afternoon uh, to to do that. The idea behind this is that there are very there are a lot of common things in a in a satellite mission, right? There, there's the the logical architecture for every satellite is very similar, even though mission-wise they may be very different in the payload that they're carrying and the and the job that they're doing. But, of, but with all these common elements, rather than starting from a blank sheet of paper, if you could start with a SysML model that's already got stakeholders filled in, some basic log logical architecture in place, um, a, a team can take this and begin to elaborate their specific mission in that, and they're, and they're starting with the leg up. We started it at, at, the, at the request of ENCOSI, the international, uh, what, uh, I forget the CO, but the system engineering organization that has participated with OMG in, in the SysML definitions, they came and said, hey, we're doing this internally as a, as a space systems working group. Um, we would like, we're doing it for academia to make it easier for these graduate students to, you know, start with something besides a blank sheet of paper and pass it on to the next class as it comes on. Um, do you have any interest in doing this? And as we shopped it around, we found out that, you know, it's not just academia that would like this. There are actually a lot of CubeSat manufacturers and other small SAT and even some large SAT manufacturers that said, you know, this, this would be useful to have this common format so that uh, a system engineer can walk into a project and, and basically already know the structure that he's going to work within uh, to elaborate the uh, requirements. Plus, it will enable tooling for automated validation and, and things like that in the specifications. So those are the specs that I wanted to talk about. We do have a couple of others. Uh, and I also wanted to talk about the future, right? What are we going to do next? Uh, as Matt mentioned, we're a member-driven organization, so it's who's here in the room that, that's going to influence us. Um, we do have on our plate a couple of things with a space operations ontology that the Air Force has asked us to look at, um, a display page exchange, which is a little different from the, the thing that Matt was describing. This is more, you know, how do I get a, an operations screen, once again, from one satellite operations center to another or from a test bed to a, an operations center? Um, because they are all using different display technologies, you know, how do, I, how do I convey that layout without having to rebuild a whole new screen uh, for that operator? And then uh, with an operations archive, uh, the same kind of idea when I'm trying to, to migrate data from one operations center to another, retaining that, op that history of operations for the satellite so that I can analyze and, and, uh, and possibly support things like AI or data mining. Um, I think that's it. Uh, thank you so much, Brad. 